Hello, everyone. My name is Kimberly McDonald, and I'm the Senior Manager of Academic Programs for Design at CCA. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly go over some logistics. First, I'd like to show you where the Q&A feature is located at the bottom of your screen. Please use this feature to ask your questions and don't put them in the chat. We may not be able to get to them all, so please be sure to upvote any questions that you'd like to be answered first. Additionally, closed captioning is available during the webinar. Next to Q&A, you should see a button that says live transcript. Click the up arrow to show subtitles, open a full transcript, or edit the size of your subtitles. If you have any trouble with this feature, please use the chat and someone on our staff can help you out. Finally, Christy, the program manager for furniture, will be putting our community agreement into the chat. Please take a moment to read it before we begin, and now I'll hand it over to Helen Maria Nugent. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are in the world. I'm Helen Maria Nugent. I'm the Dean of the Design Division here at California College of the Arts. Thank you for joining us tonight for uh, Jomo Tampi, uh, a, a, a lecture that's presented in partnership with CCA's Critical Ethnic Studies Programme. More about that in a minute. Uh, Design at CCA is a sanctuary for those with radical curiosity, a place where wonder and imagination are amplified through rigorous experimentation and deep craft. Our purpose is to equip makers, thinkers and doers with the wherewithal to envision alternate futures, and the creative capacity to deliver generative solutions that inspire change. In partnership with our colleagues in fine arts, architecture and humanities, we make art and design that matters. As you can see here on the screen, uh, the design division is six undergraduate and three graduate programs in all of the disciplines that you see here, including furniture design, our hosts for tonight. Our campuses are located in Huichin and Yelamu, also known as Oakland and San Francisco, respectively, on the unceded territories of the Chochenyo and Ramitushaloni peoples who have continuously lived upon this land since time immemorial. We recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted upon Indigenous peoples in California and the Americas, including the forced removal from ancestral lands and the deliberate and systematic destruction of their communities and culture. CCA honors Indigenous peoples, past, present, and future, here and around the world. And we wish to pay respects to our local elders with this land acknowledgement. A quick shout out to our final lecture of this series. Uh, that's going to be on March 18th at 6 p.m. And we have Margot Bloomstein, who will be talking about her new work, trust, or her new book, Trustworthy. Our lecture series um, and all of the branding has been designed this semester by Chilean graphic designer Alejandra Valenzuela. She's a graduate of our MFA in design program uh, and she calls the concept the electricity of the idea, raised dots, stitches representing all of the sensations and connections generated while creating. Uh, thank you again to Chris and Kimberly for all your work behind the scenes tonight of this event. Could Jomo, Acacia, and Kathy turn your videos on, please? Hello, 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 hello. hello. Welcome, welcome. Good Lovely to have you all here. Good evening. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, this lecture is in partnership with CCA's Critical Ethnic Studies Program because they're celebrating a really important anniversary. It's 50 years at CCA, 50 years of uplifting the voices of globally silenced people. Critical Ethnic Studies has empowered the CCA community for 50 years already and absolutely for the next 50 years. I want to say thank you, shout out to Program Chair Shaila Pacheco Hamilton and our faculty moderator from the program tonight, our co-moderator, Acacia Woods-Chan. Thank you so much for your collaboration. It's really wonderful. The representation of multiple perspectives in these conversations is critical to create change both in our fields of creative practice as well as in our daily lives. Um, and so the other person you see right here is, uh, is Catherine Lamb. Hi, let me do a quick introduction. 
Kathy is the chair of the BFA in Furniture Programme. She's an independent designer builder with over 20 years of engagement in furniture and handmade objects for the architecture and design market. She's actually a graduate of this programme, so how wonderful is that? Uh, she's currently the chair and a graduate of the programme. Um, and I think what's really interesting is she does all different kinds of work. And in recent years, she's even expanded her practice into land based works in the high desert of New Mexico. So all kinds of things happen when you study furniture at CCA. Um, I'm going to hand it over to all three of you. I'm really looking forward to your lecture, Jomo, and the talk tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Helen Maria, for the great intros. I'm going to do my own little set of intros before we launch into Jomo's uh amazing presentation um welcome everyone thank you for joining us tonight uh this is our second lecture of the year um and uh maybe i'll, I'll tell you a little bit about cca furniture and um and then get to introducing our guest tonight so the cca furniture is an undergraduate program in the design division at california college of the arts at the intersection of craft and design our lecture series this year brings focus to the diverse practices of furniture and places a critical lens upon the structures and systems embedded in craft and object production. I'm really excited that you're all here and I want to welcome you all uh, to tonight's talk with Jomo Toriku, who has graciously shared his time with us through emails, video conferences, and life experiences all shared as part of the fabric of tonight's conversation. Um, before I introduce Jomo, I want to introduce uh, my co-moderator, Critical Ethnic Studies faculty, uh, Acacia Woods Chan. Acacia is a decolonial instructor and social, culture, and language advocate. She aligns herself with the legacies of Black, Indigenous, and people of color in all diverse experiences as a tool of inclusive, community based learning. She facilitates a course entitled Decolonizing the Senses Through Creativity and emphasizes our positionality as creators within institutions that may but many times do not value, support, or represent the realities of diverse populations. Acacia uplifts awareness, compensation, and continued representation of intersecting identities, including race, ethnicity, culture, sex, gender, citizenship, nationality, language, class, ability, and more. Um, it's been a real pleasure to work with Acacia, so thank you for joining us. Um, and now to introduce our guest speaker, Jomo Tariko. Jomo is Kenyan born, raised in Ethiopia, and now calls Virginia home. With early exposure to woodworking as a young artist, Jomo earned his degree in industrial design at the University of Kansas. Jomo is a member of the Black Artists and Designers Guild, and his work is well known and exhibited in the global furniture design industry. We're really thrilled to welcome him tonight to learn more about the objects he has visioned into existence as well as the conditions and context that have informed the what as well as the why of his works. So with that, welcome Jomo. Well, uh, thank you, um, Catherine, for that uh, wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, we'd like to say thank you also to Acacia for uh, the uh, discussion we've had and CCA for, of course, having me over to uh, to talk about my journey. Um, hopefully there is something to, uh, I'm certain there is something to learn and uh, grab on to, to, uh, to your audience. So uh, without further ado, let me see if I can connect to my uh, PowerPoint. And if it doesn't work, please let me know. So my, my story or my tale is about perseverance, um, sticking to your gun, um, coming up with, trying to come up with a new and different idea. Uh, once you look back at your own self and at your own heritage and culture and saying, what can I do to have that positive story that is missing out of uh, most African countries? Uh, being born and raised um, until, you know, I got done with high school and came to the U.S. to study. Uh, these things have been, you know, going back and forth in my mind. So uh, let me start by showing you what my logo is. My logo is, uh, uh, we work with a wonderful graphic designer who's actually based out of California right now. And once I communicated what my name meant, uh, and, you know, my last name, Tariku, which means story. She said, you, you're trying to leave an impression, a fingerprint. So that's where this whole concept came. Of course, it says Jomo. 
but that's what she went along with and created this for me. Um, let me see if I, um, this is like the perfect definition of my struggle and the struggle of a lot of uh, people of color who practice design. Uh, what Professor Ramon Tejada uh, pretty much encapsulates here uh, speaks to me and my experience so well. Um, and if, if you don't mind, I'll like to quickly read it. As a designer, I have come to the terms of the facts that what and who design history has been interested in canonizing up to this point does not reflect me, my culture, my values, and many of the tenets that make me a citizen, a designer, and a teacher. I don't see myself reflected in much of the narrative of design, not in the history, the, th the theory, the practitioners, or the outcomes. Uh, we'll kind of come back to this because there's been a lot of change, but I wanna quickly show you uh, my journey <clears throat> using just a basic timeline, uh, starting late, of course, I wasn't born in 85, um, but I, as a kid, uh, did apprenticeship in a very small wood shop. Uh, it's, it's kind of surprising that I ended up doing furniture because this was something to do during summer break for me and uh, something that got me out of boredom. And we did it, in, me and my younger brother did it in 83, then 85. Then in 87, uh, I came to the US to study at a very small college in Kansas. Uh, then I quickly moved on to University of Kansas uh, design program where I was introduced to what industrial, industrial design is, which I've never heard of uh, prior to that. Uh, but the description by the professor who gave me a breakdown on it, just convinced me this is what I wanna do for the rest of my life, even though the reason I wanted to go to KU was to study fine arts. After five years of industrial design study, of course, uh, like most programs, you do your senior thesis and what I concentrated on was uh, African furniture design, you know, as a, as a, as a uh, you know, newly minted to be industrial designer, what I, what I looked back into uh, my, my experience in college in my time spent in the art and design library, going through a multitude of magazines and books is just like Professor Tahada's uh, quote said, I was not represented in there. My work was not, when I say my, I'm, I'm saying my kind. Uh, and if it is, it is because somebody copied it and put it in there. So what I tried to do is even back then say to myself, what can I do that is based on my own heritage, culture and background that I can breathe new life into what traditional craftspeople have done within Africa. So I'm not the first or last to be uh, a designer. It's just that I happen to come to a Western uh, school system where I got to get a degree to call myself a designer and in the future work on branding my name and trying to take it to someone else. But prior to me, there is a multitude of craftspeople who have created um, a lot of furniture pieces since I was working on furniture, but other crafts. So that was what my thesis was based on. And what I worked on was how do you move ideas from things you see around you into objects that actually speak back to, my, to me and others that it is from Africa. So after graduation, uh, like most immigrants, you, you, you go through the whole um, immigration issue. Uh, it took another five years to get my immigration status lined up. And the reason I, I am mentioning this is what I got is called a national, national interest waiver. And it was all based on my furniture thesis. Uh, so the, the reason I got the permission to stay in the US and keep practicing uh, as an independent designer is because I, I presented to the immigration court uh, the amount of uh, design I've worked on that is based on Africa. Uh, and, and talking about, you know, reflecting back, this is one lesson about why students at an early stage should be serious about what they do in the, for their thesis. Because at the end of this tale, 
I'm still working on my thesis. What, what the, the objects that I'll show you later on are based on what I started back in 92 and 93. So kind of a lesson to all students, take your thesis seriously is not something that you wanna you know, zip through and uh, move to another thing. Uh, in 2000, I moved to DC. Uh, I established my first, my first studio with a partner uh, called Jomo Design. Um, that business ran for about eight years. The very first show that I uh, attended with my design was Architectural uh, Digest show in New York City. Uh, barely had any impact. What I thought uh, would be good timing by then to talk about and show and demonstrate what modern African furniture would be. Uh, you could literally say no one paid attention to it except uh, one, one TV show coming and doing a, a video shoot. Um, and that is because the host of the show was also a black designer. Uh, Sheila Bridges uh, show came and did a, a shoot. Uh, 2008 was the highlight of, uh, I think my design career back then uh, was selected for a curated show on black creativity. Uh, at the museum, that Chicago Museum of Science and Industry, uh, it was uh, it was very exciting. It was I thought finally uh, we're getting we're making an impact, but um, unfortunately, the economy crashed. We our design studio, which was uh, partially a graphic design and web design studio, was dependent on clients paying us, and with the economy tanking we had a decent amount of clients who were unable to pay us and made, made a, the decision after eight years of uh, struggling through it that it is time to close. Uh, unfortunately, that's when I kind of literally walked away from doing furniture. Uh, pretty much I used to do, I used to dedicate enough time to go to the shop, um, uh, which I was a member at and build my stuff. Uh, I completely dropped that and just maybe did sketches uh, and maybe some 3D stuff. But uh, I said, look, I'm not making any difference in the industry. You know, magazines and uh, publications don't care too much about anything related to Africa when it comes to modern design. Maybe they'll do other things, but not that specifically. So I pretty much walked away from it. Uh, when I walked away, I, I got employment at the World Bank uh, within the data group as a designer. Uh, so 2008 until now, that's what I do as my day job as a data scientist. Um, and then in 2015, um, a publisher who'd seen my old work uh, reached out to me and said they wanted to publish my work, which I was a bit hesitant saying, that is old work. I don't have anything. I haven't done anything in about seven years. I don't want to be showing old work, but she insisted that it gets uh, some visibility. So I'm glad uh, I did that, but still didn't hit me if timing is right to come back to uh, my furniture design work. Then in 2016, uh, Design Festival out of Ethiopia uh, invited me again. And my answer was kind of similar. I said, look, I haven't done any work. What do you want? All I have is 3D graphics at best is what I can give you. Uh, thinking that they would say no, but that's what they took. And that in, in a weird way opened the door to an invitation to Dubai uh, Design Week where then I had to prototype the same uh, 3D rendering for that. Uh, that was quickly successively followed by uh, other invitations uh, what Dubai demonstrated to me was the, um, if I, I want to regress a little bit, in, while we were showing in Dubai, it was amazing how much uh, traffic we got. So for me, what it said was maybe finally people are noticing what makes African design just not only unique, but what we bring to the market. Uh, so that was the first time I had got an inclination that I should pay attention to what I'm doing uh, and maybe get back into the whole furniture design thing all over again. In the following year, of course, all of these invitations came in, which I uh, participated. 
uh, in 2018, um, Milan Furniture Fair uh, did a show on uh, the global sales, uh, as it is coined by the by the industry, um, which where they inv invited about 20 designers uh, from Africa and the diaspora, and 20 from South America and Latin America and the diaspora. So. Uh, I represented Ethiopia and of course attended. Uh, I wanna quickly go, things were picking up, but um, in if you see at the bottom, I, I under 2018, I've put, I have joined uh, the BAD, BAD G. BAD G stands for Black Artists and Designers Guild. And uh, I wanna reference what that means from and what, what the reason for uh, joining that group uh, was. Uh, so in 2018, there was an event in New York called What's New, What's Next, where uh, some major magazines and the sponsors invited about, let's say about more than 70 designers and uh, moderators. Out of those of almost 90 guests, there was not even one black designer. And this was an event that was going to talk about what's new and what's next. And our voice was not represented there. Is, 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 it, is, it is as if we didn't even exist in 2018, like uh, in, as if it is back in uh, 2000. Uh, luckily with this thing popping up, uh, Melanie Barnett, who's an artist based out of New York, uh, wrote a very strong worded response to this whole event. And we established uh, through her fine, um, Founding, uh, she ended up founding Black Artists and Designers Guild, and a uh, few of us got together to, of course, uh, help her put it together. And I ended up being one of the co founders. And the, one of the conversations we had when she called me was really saying, Look, the, this is how the industry has been. We got to change it. Do you want to be part of it? And of course, my own experience of 20 something years. Uh, of not having my work exposed uh, to the right uh, institutions and uh, publications, the, the answer was, of course, I wanna be part of this. I'll do anything that is possible. And I've learned as a, a big lesson, most of us designers like to work by ourselves because we want all the credit for ourselves. Uh, but as you get older and you mature that you notice uh, collaboration is more important than than just uh, winging it by yourself. Uh, the end result of working with uh, the Guild is getting uh, my work, the attention of uh, publications that previously had ignored him. Uh, and again, this comes because I was open to collaborate with other Guild members to, to show together, uh, contribute money together, work with uh, different ideas together. Um, so kind of the importance of working together matters. Now you might, a lot of people come back to me saying, asking, how do you change the industry? Uh, you, you know, I as a single designer and working sometimes with guild members, these are some of the things we discussed. And you need to add that with uh, recent events because we don't, all of these things are not happening in a vacuum. Even though we've been doing some work prior to uh, the Black Lives Matter um, movement um, uh, restarting all over again in uh, 2019 and making a huge impact, that only did not only happen on the streets, but people who were involved in advocating for Black Lives were also advocating that industries in different areas change. And one of the industries that got pushed uh, very hard is that it's the whole design industry. There was a lot of design companies who kept on posting uh, the black squares uh, to, uh, you know, to show support. But what what that ended up uh, making for you know advocates of Black Lives is, you know, is one thing to post a black uh, square on your Instagram or social media feed, but what are you doing when it comes to hiring? you know, black designers, black experts, black uh, employees to do this or that. And that challenge uh, started a very good conversation. 
But on top of that, what we need to do to change the industries, of, of course, to work on, on data collection, we need to do a lot of research. Uh, as, while we're working on that, of course, we need um, to demonstrate that we are more than capable to do the work. Uh, and we need to have dialogue with anyone that is willing to listen. Uh, some of these people that you think are, that, that are working against you, if you, if you approach them and demonstrate certain things, they're bound to change. If they don't, it's time to move on. You cannot convince everyone. And I've learned that through a long career in life. I'm more than willing to just pick up my stuff and move on. But working on your portfolio all the time, sharing your knowledge and mentoring others is one way to do that. Uh, build your own narrative. I always like to talk about my African side, my African design, my African her heritage. If people don't like it, it doesn't bother me, uh, but this is who I am. And building our own narrative and uh, talking about a rich history is one way to define and make sure we are represented uh, pretty well. Uh, and collaborations, I really believe collaboration is the way to go. I understand as designers, we need, we, or artists, we want independence. Don't lose that. But on the flip side, don't completely abandon working with others. It's a must that we need to do that or else we really don't have the resources to go toe to toe with the big boys uh, out, out there. Um, and when it comes to data, I just wanna share with you uh, something that I did, which is um, um, a kind of, when in research, uh, I, I scrape data. I mean, that's what I do during my daytime I'm, uh, anyway. So I scrape data from different companies, trying to see how many black designers uh, each of these world leading uh, furniture companies hire. So on the left, what you see is, I don't know if it's visible, but the, any, any of these companies, even the best one has not hired more than two designers, two black designers. And some kind of companies like Danae Rosé uh, has 182 designers they work with and only one color designer in their, uh, in their team. So it, it kind of shows you the disparity. So what, what I kind of would like to encourage people is to collect data like this, uh, look at it from a different angle and just present it. Uh, because of this type of research, this, this has ended up uh, being mentioned on on New York Times and a couple of other uh, design blogs and it become a topic of discussion because it's kind of hard to hide from data. Um, the other thing is to going back to Professor Tejada's uh, quote when I started is uh, even when it comes to publications, instead of skimming through and saying, I'm not represented here, actually start cataloging uh, how much of the, of the representation is missing. So this is something that uh, if you've seen the Atlas of Furniture Design, it's a pretty thick book from uh, Vitra. Uh, one of the things that they claim is the book has about 1,740 objects uh, or furniture pieces to show. But I'm trying to demonstrate here to you uh, is only three of them are by uh, a black designers. So again, it's not only we're missing in other places, but publications that potentially students use as a reference is where you're missing. Uh, this is what I was missing when I was going to libraries. I would go through, you know, multitude of books and uh, magazines. And again, I wouldn't see even one black designer in those books back then. So the, the object is to also make sure books that end up in our schools are wholesome and have what is needed. The other thing that this book does uh, on the last page is it, it lists about 88, if I'm not mistaken, styles and movements of design. And out of 88 of them, there's nothing that includes what color people have contributed when it comes to design. Not even Afrofuturism is listed here. Uh, everything and anything in between uh, is listed here. And some of them I've never even heard of, like Napoleon III, I don't know what kind of movement that is. Uh, but again, I think Afrofuturism is a major movement that should have been listed. There was more than 70 something authors that worked on this book, should have occurred to at least one of them to say what was going on here. 
Um, let me quickly go to my design. So I base all of my work on themes and ideas and concepts uh, from Africa. And of course, obviously the first target would be uh, seedings that are already pre-exist. I, I look at these things and the goal is not to exactly copy or emulate them, but to get inspiration from these objects. Uh, I, I make sure that if I base my work on something, I name it with the same uh, object's name so you can make easily reference if you, if you Google it or uh, if you need to find the story behind it and it, it happens not to be mentioned. There is no intention here to hide the fact what has influenced me. Um, so these are objects that I like. These are things that I usually uh, uh, bookmark and think about. Um, and th this is a pretty close up uh, look of the same stools. So like I mentioned, uh, furniture is not the only uh, obvious uh, inspiration. I try to grab inspiration from architecture, from wildlife, from scarification, hairstyles, uh, body paint, um, you know, cultural dances, cultural clothes, uh, hair weaving, landscape. Um, I want to make my um, uh, what I base on as broad as possible. And I have unfortunately moved away from doing full blown sketches and renderings. I've gone to uh, thumbnail sketches and there's a reason behind this. Uh, I do a lot of my sketching on my way to my day job uh, on the uh, DC Metro and you know, holding a sketch pad, what, uh, what gets me going is you know, within the space I have is, a, is a, my pencil and my paper that I can hold with my hand. So, and it, it also lets me do uh, different iteration of drawings. I don't do full blown drawings anymore. Uh, and going back to inspiration, this is this chair, for example, that I did is called Makwamia. The object you see to your to your right is called uh, Makwamia. It's, a, it's, it's an ornament that they put on a prayer stick uh, during long church um, uh, ceremonies for people to lean against. So, um, you know, I, I kind of spun off this idea into a, a three-legged uh, chair. Uh, the other thing I want to include with this uh, with this design ideas that I have, because I grew up with um, three-legged stools all around me, and I kind of tend to be a little bit obsessed by it. Most of my sketches, when it comes to seating, start as uh, three-legged, and things don't go work. Things don't work out design-wise. Uh, or structurally, I kind of jump to four to the fourth uh, leg if need be. But uh, I kind of like the whole what a three-legged chair and stool look like, so I stick to that. This is a stool that is based on a water jug that uh, most um, countryside women carry uh, to grab water from farther away. This is kind of a pretty back-breaking. Uh, process. Just imagine having a full jug of water on your back uh, with that shape. Uh, but it is something, again, that I've, I've seen growing up a lot and has been imprinted in my brain. And the inspiration uh, behind this tool, which is called Linsara, and the object is called Linsara also, uh, is, uh, is the water jug that this lady is carrying. Uh, my Niala chair is based on the Niala antelope uh, from the highlands of uh, the Bali Mountains. Uh, it's the male Niala has this beautifully uh, curved uh, horns that uh, kind of inspired this chair. Again, uh, you know, it is a three-legged chair. Uh, th this this chair was a was a, a work of passion for me. Uh, we. Uh, I went through different iterations. Uh, I looked for a craftsperson who is who would be capable of doing this. It took a decent amount of time, and uh, the craftsperson who ended up working on it is just as passionate about making it as I was designing it. Um, and it has tiny details everywhere. When it, even the bottom is curved a little bit, so 
different angles give you uh, a different feel when it is, you know, when you see it on a pedestal. And here are a few other shots of the same chair. Uh, this is a spin-off product uh, of the stool uh, from the Niana chair. Of course, the base looked like uh, a, a good spin-off that you can make. So uh, we did two different iterations. The top right one is stackable uh, and the left one is just a normal uh, stool slash uh, end table. Um, well, you know, an Afro hair pick has been something that also has fascinated me. This is, you know, something when I was younger, Afro style was uh, the in thing. And there are different tribes within Africa and within Ethiopia that uh, will comb their hair and stick it back, just like the photo on your left. So it, it was something that I kept on looking and saying, this object is speaking to me a certain way. And what kind of chair can I create out of it? Um, yeah, and, and again, just like the Niala chair with this, this chair design has gone through so many transitions and, and there's a totally different one that I've done that, that I'll be showing by the end of this year. Uh, but this was the first one that I did. Uh, the Shanti stool, if uh, most of you know, it is, is based out of uh, a Guinean or West African stool. A very popular one. I've, uh, I've always liked this tool. I've always wanted to do something related to it. But again, I always wanted an, a reinterpretation by my own view of what I, it should be if an industrial designer did it based on a, a shanti stool. And the idea of the whole height adjustable thing came along um, as I was fiddling around with with, the, with this idea I said, okay, it's too low, but if I can raise it a little bit, maybe it can cover, uh, you know, ergonomically uh, different heights. Uh, if you use it as, a, as an uh, end table, it could serve different things. So um, this is the design that was uh, derived from it. It's a three piece, the pin and the seat and the base. Um, again, um, this, this is another stool that is based, we call this, uh, at least in Ethiopia, uh, and, and again, it is the, my interpretation of what a modern piece would look like uh, made out of a carbon fiber. Um, in this one, same concept as the Ashanti, which is the uh, height adjustable one, but again, you know, uh, the, the headrest that you see on the left side, it is used. And th this, this headrest idea is found through different tribes people within, uh, within Sub-Saharan Africa. This specific headrest is from the Oromia region of uh, Ethiopia. And you know I looked at it and said, I gotta make a stool out of this idea. And the way I derive these shapes is instead of just looking at the object and making another object that looks like it, uh, I went through the one exercise where I was only drawing the silhouette shape of an object and trying to see what that silhouette is uh, pretty much speaking back to me. Uh, that way, I, and, and the reason you, you see a much cleaner without any uh, intricate design on the right is because that approach was used. Uh, I was not worried about the carvings and the inner workings of, of all these objects. I was just drawing the outside of it and trying to see what that, uh, from a design uh, perspective, was saying to me. Uh, this is based, uh, this is another exercise. Uh, at an earlier time, I went through the whole idea of having a chair with interchangeable backrest. Um, and uh, I was, you know, the, the whole Maasai shield becoming attached and detached. And you know, you hold it as a shield, then you set it up as a totem. If that you know, does not appeal to you or you have a series of three, you take one out, you put one in and you have a different looking chair. Uh, it's a conceptual idea uh, that you know, I'm, I'm still fiddling around. Uh, I've gone through a few prototypes. There's, there should be also a new one based on this coming out. Uh, hopefully by the end of the year. Um, and this is one of the prototypes uh, that 
that was initially done where you can flip around the backrest, take it out, put another one in. Uh, again, this, this idea was also designed with the concept of a collaborative work. What would happen if I'm working with a designer, let's say out of California and I'm in DC and they design a pattern, a carving that can go on the backrest. Uh, they can send it to uh, a wood carver or a CNC machine operator, and they can have a totally new custom design. So you can just imagine how many different backrest ideas you can come up with. Uh, and as just to make a point of that, I've like sketched about 80 something patterns that could be carved on, on the chair like this. And you know, these are additional spin-offs from the same idea. Uh, this one is called uh, Kabaro. Kabaro is the drum that, that, is being, that is used in the Orthodox Church in Ethiopia. And this is based on that. Uh, it's still a work in progress. And this one is based on a Zulu hut uh, pattern. And it was, the, the pattern on these huts was fascinating. I'm just looking at it and saying from the top of the center of the hut, all the way down, this thing, you know, fans out. So, you know, what I was thinking, what, what does it again say to me? If I, if I had to turn this concept into a stool, you know, what would it look like? It's still a, a 3D concept at the moment, but this is how uh, I, I use, you know, my own cultural heritage as a reference point to design something that's unique and for, for today. Uh, this one is called Mukacha. Mukacha is the, uh, what you use for graining, uh, for pounding grain. Um, and again, look how beautiful the one on the left is, you know. So again, objects and silhouettes are said doing something when it comes to a furniture reinterpretation of uh, what I think should be. An, All right, thank you. That's um, pretty much is it. Uh, thank you so much, Jonah. It was great. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we are <clears throat> officially moving into sort of the discussion and Q and A section. So um, I will keep an eye on the Q and A. I just want to say that uh, last week, Acacia, Jomo, and I. We got into a really great, what was again, supposed to be like a half hour discussion, quick Zoom check-in turned into this really wonderful, you know, hour plus discussion. So I'm hoping we can sort of pick up on some of the things that we were talking about, but also um, talk about some of the Q and A. So um, Acacia, can I, can I hand this over, hand the mic to you at this point? And, uh... Yes, definitely. And thank you so much for such an insightful introduction. I know that there's so many more things that, um, you know, I would love to sit in and hear about, um, but we do want to leave the opportunity for students. And you know, I know my students who are here. I hope that you will ask some questions as well. Um, so we have a couple of questions that we have predetermined. However, I do want to go to the Q and A for students and um, read a couple of those before we will go with our predetermined questions. So we have one question that says, um, "Jomo, thank you for a fascinating and revealing talk." I'm curious if you've worked with craftspeople in the communities whose traditional designs have inspired you to fabricate, to fabricate or co-design any of your projects. Uh, I've attempted this. So with each trip um, to Ethiopia, I have a, an, ex, uh, an amazing uh, artist designer friend who lives in, in Ethiopia, who moved from here, who does furniture, um, uh, who used to do furniture here. So at least when it comes to the case of Ethiopia, the finding wood supply ended up being the bottleneck for us. Um, but it would have been, um, it is something that I'm still trying to figure out if it is not uh, making it there, you know, how, how, can I, how can I contribute all this knowledge that I've acquired through the years? Maybe the next generation uh, would, would solve this problem. The, the biggest problem is uh, deforestation. Uh, Ethiopia used to have a decent amount of uh, forest, well, ages ago, uh, but because of firewood being used as a source of energy has pretty much eliminated, uh, has left the land barren. Um, so 
of course, I don't want to be part of the problem of more forest uh, deforestation. Uh, now, I've looked into maybe doing stuff uh, out of Rwanda. Uh, that did not pan out, but it is, it is always at the back of my mind. After all, I'm doing uh, African furniture. I want craftspeople from, uh, from the continent to work on some of them. Uh, again, maybe uh, after July 1st, uh, maybe with things changing in my life uh, and getting full attention to that, it is something I want to look into, uh, but I haven't given up. It is, it's, it's an ongoing thing. It's just as a single designer, it's not the easiest challenge to overcome. Right, yeah, definitely. Um, and that leads a little bit into another question that we have is, um, well, first of all, thank you so much. Um, as an already famous African designer, have you ever considered setting up an organization of black designers? Um, and then also, you know, just so other black designers can help each other. And then a second part of that question is, do you advise or appeal to investors of color to start new brands? Um, that way designers of color may have more opportunities to showcase their talents. Uh, on the last one, yes, because I'm, I'm trying to do the same thing. I'm, you know, I don't have any licensed work or anything. I'm, I invest all the money that I have and make uh, with my younger brother being the silent partner in our business. Uh, it, it's just a challenge um, trying to work with larger companies. I, I want to be able to, uh, to forge a new way, a new, new black brand when it comes to furniture uh, into the industry if possible at all. I know I have the, uh, the decent depth in my portfolio. It's a matter of making sure other parts of it work. And I, I want other black designers. Now, this is not for everyone else. And this is something that keeps me up all, uh, long at night, um, planning and scheming on how to make it work. Um, so if you decide to do it, it is something that is uh, worth, worth the pain you will go through to make it because the industry needs it. You need to be able to say, I, I want to do something my way. Uh, the reason that people didn't accept these type of designs is because of their predisposed concept of what African design should be, is what I think. Um, the, the, uh, the question about Black Designers Association is, or a, a group starting, again, if you want, if you want a, a local one, fine, but the reason we started the Black Artists and Designers Guild is because uh, at least at our level of professional designers, we, we thought we didn't have the representation and the, uh, and the power that comes with representation. It, one, of, one of the things I liked about what the, our guild did uh, effectively, and the guild is not the first black designer uh, group, by the way, there's uh, others within architecture, there's interior design and so on, is not to focus on doing annual conferences, but trying to do things differently? Can we do smaller shows? Uh, can, we, can we press upon the, the media that is based out of New York when it comes to design to change their concept and the perception about black designers and black designers work? So, uh, and it, 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 I really believe it uh, bore fruit. Uh, is others do other things and it works but we needed to make a huge leap forward and that type of approach really helped. Yeah, the, the Guild is, is amazing. I mean, it's, uh, how many years has it been? Only two. Okay. Yeah. And I, I feel like in, in those short two years, you know, the Bad Guild is really visible. Um, and I, yeah. yeah, and I think, you know, for students and for, you know, for people that are interested in, in making a change and making a mark, you know, in the industry, you know, I think it's a really amazing example of how working together is really, yes, you know, the way to do that. Yeah, and that's what I emphasized about collaboration. Look, mm -hmm. I personally know I can do these designs by myself, but that attitude can take me so far. Uh, so it's not about how great of a designer you are. No doubt all of you will be great designers. But you want to make a, a difference or a change in the way uh, 
the design industry operates, especially when it comes to uh, involving uh, people of color in the design world, you better collaborate because you're not gonna be cutting it. If you go in there by yourself, you'll be afraid to even mention, so how come you guys are not hiring two or three or four more? Because the fear of you even losing your job becomes the issue. Uh, you know, I've, you know, at my age, the fear of someone not hiring me does not bother me you know, also anymore. I mean, when I pulled out that stats, big companies had to respond to the uh, New York Times article. Jomo by himself wouldn't have done that. But having the guild behind me uh, to support something like that, and finally the media saying we can't keep quiet, this is just blatantly obvious, now we have the data. Okay. The big guys had to respond. But I gave the same presentation, I think, at, at Princeton before uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement blew up again. No one paid attention to that. But timing and collaboration and uh, working together, uh, you know, put that up, up there and people had to respond. And we'll check within a year, collect the same data and see if anything has changed. I doubt it, but we'll keep working on it. And I'll just ask one last question before we'll turn it over to Catherine. Um, so, and it's it, this is a little bit of a mix with a question that we pre, like pre-populated and then also with this um, next question from an anonymous attendee. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, any advice that you have for African descendant design, de African descendant designers who are struggling with being seen and heard as they move their, their, through their education and begin their careers? So that's a question from Anonymous. And secondly, um, if you could expand upon some of your choices that you made in your education and career and some of the things that you have gained by positioning and by prioritizing um, what was important to you personally and professionally and some of the things that you have risked or some of the things that you have sacrificed by making those choices? Hmm. Well, risk-wise, I think I just covered it, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, um, I don't wanna say it exposing, well, it's kind of exposing, you know, grabbing all that data on these companies, well, I'm sure has made some of them very uncomfortable. Uh, so those are risks that you have to take. But, but again, if you are a collective, taking that risk uh, won't, be, won't feel as risky as you initially would think if you were doing it by yourself. Um, as, as an advice, I mean, um, I think I've been personal, personal decisions and maybe personal experiences will be slightly different for everybody. Uh, for me, um, you know, I, I had parents who, who let me pursue my passion. They never asked me, um, why are you, after making you come all the way to the U.S. and going to a major university, why are you studying design? So I never had um, that problem when I started. So I think that was a big, big hurdle to overcome. And what I would encourage uh, parents of um, uh, people of color who are kids who are colored, people of color, who are very creative to encourage them. There is a career uh, to be pursued. There is a, a, a way to shine through this creative work, especially when it comes to uh, design. And, you know, at least in, within the immigrant community and others, because I know other, other artists and designers, most have been discouraged by their parents. It's like, oh, it's not gonna pay. You know, you, you might have to keep two or three jobs. Well, I keep two jobs, so that part of it is slightly true. Um, but, you know, I, I think encouragement at an early age would be great. My father is the one who uh, took me to do the apprenticeship in our neighborhood at the woodshop, uh, a career uh, a soldier. And uh, after that, uh, you know, a diplomat, then a, a businessman. He knows nothing about when it comes to building, he did appreciate craft. But, but again, once that carried me over to this, he's never ever said to me, this is something you shouldn't do. So <clears throat> my own personal experience when it comes to that. Now to, to risk, so I've already said my, I've failed in business once, uh, you know, 
it's a learning experience. I don't want to call it fail. There, there are a lot of moving parts. So there is risk in going out by yourself. What have I learned when I restarted is to minimize my expenses and my exposure. I, I, you know, like here, I work out of my basement. I have no need, I, as an ego, I would love to have a studio so I can say I have a studio, but there's no need for that. I think my work is more important than having studio space somewhere or gallery space somewhere. So reduce, reduce, even this applies to everyone. Reduce your cost, reduce your uh, expenses. Don't, don't waste money. Uh, you know, as a graphic designer, I design my own brochures. I design my own booklets. I bring a lot of things in-house to cover my expenses. Um, but the, the other part I want to talk about is be bold. Be, you know, talk about, you know, set your narrative as, as a Black designer. What do you want to communicate? You don't have to follow my, my way, but have your own story. And your story should stand. It is nothing that should hold you back. Um, you know what, f for me, when I go to show, I remember the first time I showed in the US, well, uh, 84 when I had no, I mean, 94 when I had no impact versus when I went to ICFF and uh, I saw more black attendant, uh, attendance and more black people interacting with me. And that facial reaction I got was just, uh, was, was precious, you know, people would be walking by the booth and they would be staring at my stuff and saying, what, who did this? You, you're the one, are you the salesman or are you the designer? This thing looks African or it looks like a, you know, that, that emotional uh, response that I got, it was just purely genuine. I wish, you know, I didn't think I was gonna get that kind of reaction. So there's no camera or anything. But I remember calling my wife at the end of the day saying, you know, this is the type of day I had. And I, you know, you, this could only happen because I stuck by my main principle years ago saying the industry needs it. And the audience, I kept on arguing, the audience will respond to it the same way. And the first reaction I got, so this is 2017, I think. So just imagine I made that point in 93, but the first response that I got to that kind of level of uh, reaction is, you know, in 2017. So, uh, you know, when I started the presentation, I said perseverance, the story of uh, the, uh, the black history in the US is about perseverance. I mean, you, you just have to hold on to that. And it applies to design, it applies to history, it applies to many things. Just don't give up and just make sure you stick with others to make sure you rise above the water. Uh, or else it's easy to give up. Didn't I give up? I did give up. I walked away for about seven years. Uh, other than doing sketching, you know, that 2008 is fatigue and having no impact. And I'm saying, I can't keep doing this when I have two new little kids to worry about and family to uh, brand new family to raise. So, but, but at the end of the day, I've always sketched and that's uh, what saved me as when, when the publisher and the design festival organizers came back. So um, stay in the game. Wise words, stay in the game. It's true, you know, I think, I mean, I graduated from the program in 98 and you know, my, my trajectory has uh, taken, I think what I didn't know were normal turns, you know, going from studio practice into design and you know, over 20 plus years, um, careers evolve and then change. And I think that's, that's something that, you know, when you don't come from, um, if your family or your upbringing is not uh, steeped in art and design, sometimes it gets hard to know that. And I think, you know, um, Part of part of my interest in in your career, along with your beautiful work, I think, is uh, your willingness to talk about how diverse your practice and your life really is when it comes to work and 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 making mm -hmm. a career in furniture. Is, is it's not easy, but I think the thing that I admire most is that. Um, and maybe there's probably a question in here somewhere, but I'll just I'll just start talking about it. But but I think there's this idea that you know. Um, 
and we talked about this last week too, you know, when we, when we look at work, we talk about these terms like craft, art, fine art, design, we have all these sort of categories of how we define things. Um, if we start defining ourselves as creative people through those categories, it's very limiting. And so when I talk to my students about, well, what does it mean to be a designer or what is craft? You know, really, it's kind of, um, it's really like we're the creative sort of uh, channel. The work itself, you know, can maybe be defined as craft or artist design, but we're as creative people leaving ourselves open to doing all kinds of work, I think is really important. And your practice, I think, really reflects that. I mean, a data scientist and a furniture designer who did work woodworking as a young artist, and you're still hands-on as well. So I think a lot of what I see is that a lot of your um, and you know, some of it might be practical come out of practicality, but I think your 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 broad concept of creativity is what keeps you, you know, in the game, which yes, I think is pretty amazing. Um, I just want to do, sorry, I just want to do a quick time, we will have to continue, but I just want to do a quick time check in that it's, it's, we're about seven, just a little past seven. If anyone needs to go, please feel free. We're going to probably just keep talking for another maybe five or 10 minutes, but um, just to let everyone know, we, we will be recording, this is being recorded. It'll be, um, as Chrissy said, uploaded to Panopto and also posted on Portal for anyone who needs to, to go. Um, so appreciate that. Um, sorry, so just wanted to do that little check-in before we continue. Um, no, I was just gonna add to that, that um, you know, the whole design, art, craft, um, especially for me, I, uh, like I mentioned to you earlier, when I, I was at a, uh, at a smaller college, um, the reason I left it is because a professor there and then a painting elective class kept on saying, if you can paint like this, what are you doing in this small school? Uh, the good thing about it was I was not good at anything else. So the only thing I enjoyed was this elective where we were doing painting. Uh, so when I went to KU was to do fine arts to quickly find out what industrial design is and then jump to that one um, to later on, to work with my hands and trying to combine what, you know, the fine arts part of it, the crafts part of it, the, you know, the design. And I tend to be also a little bit techy. So the whole 3D thing and, you know, uh, using CNC or, you know, I haven't gotten into 3D printing much, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's using the right tool for the right uh, design. I hopefully you've noticed that my my design kind of ranges from what you can do is hand carved chair versus a stool that is cut out of cnc um, i'm not specifically tied to the technology i prefer to design something that speaks to me than worry about how how the hell we're gonna make it um, up to now that seems to work um, because again it's a small studio I tend to make things out of uh, wood. I have an excellent uh, craftsman that works on my, a couple of my chairs. Um, so we develop that relationship. Uh, we talk, we discuss, we go over sketches, the prototypes, then come back and we do it again. So all, all disciplines will be imposed on this. Awesome. Um, I just noticed that a uh, really good question. Well, there are two questions still left in the queue, and I want to make sure we get to both of them. Um, and I hope the person whose question I'm about to ask won't mind me identifying her as a very established furniture educator. Um, Wendy Mariama uh, writes, thank you for your presentation, Jomo. Do you have any thoughts on how to draw young 15 to 20 year olds uh, POC into the design field? Uh, well, other than uh, making sure at least the, the, the kids who are creative not to be discouraged. And, and this is I, I, the reason I say this is because I've witnessed it. I, I've witnessed this within um, black parents and uh, that circle because they know I'm a designer. They end up coming to me and asking, saying, hey, you seem to be doing OK. I'm trying to discourage my kid is thinking about, you know, going into the creative field. But all I hear about is the job prospect. And I totally get that. So it's not like I am uh, uh, not 
not understanding these concerns that the parents have. So one obstacle is definitely making sure that parents are comfortable with creative uh, kids and not to discourage them and to, to help them develop that talent. Uh, um, we, we're hoping also in organizations like the Guild and others at some point to do mentorship program that goes down to the level of that age group because we, most of us, not me again, but others that I know have gone through this issue we're talking about. If it's not the parent that is discouraging you, maybe it's your house, high school counselor that is saying, look, uh, you know, you're not gonna cut it because this, your type don't exist in this industry or that. Um, so hopefully the, the tendency to fix this comes from different angle and it, we don't all put it on the, uh, on the parent, it should be the school system also trying to encourage and watching out for uh, kids that can develop their creative skills that can help them move into higher education and get what they want. It's not only also not making it through college, but also to encourage them to shine once they get into the industry. There are a lot of people again, who could easily walk away after <clears throat> Uh, you know, going through college, proving the point of the parents saying, look, after all, uh, you did this. So changing the industry, changing school, changing parents' perception, I think is going to help the kids uh, being creative. Of course, if uh, people close to them, I'm, for example, I'm, I'm crazy about watching any type of tutorials to a point my wife tells me to change the YouTube channel, because it's always about cutting drawing, doing this or that while we're having dinner. Um, but also to, to get resources. I mean, when I went to college, if I don't go to the shop and put in the work, there's nowhere else to get the skill. Uh, there were only few books that would show you this. But now at least you can uh, introduce your young you know, kids what it means to be creative by showing other people who are successful right in between or starting because these, these things are all over social media. There are people who say, hey, I just started my shop. You know, this is what I went through. I just had my first accident. This is what you should be careful of and so on and so on. And use those tools. Uh, I think it's ripe if you really pay attention. The timing is ripe, just like things are happening for me at this later stage, for people uh, coming through the system now, I think is there is, relatively speaking, better ways to learn and improve your skills uh, uh, today than, than it was years ago. Yeah, I think mentorship is a really important and uh, um, yes. important and uh, I'm not gonna say it's overlooked, but I think it's, it's kind of undervalued. I mean, I know that, you know, I'm just gonna tell a quick story about myself, but when I was a student at CCA, I did the workshop with the artist, David Nash, and he invited me to work with him in Wales for the summer to, to be his like a detailer or whatever. And I was just, I had no idea what it was. And so I said, no, cause I didn't have enough money to get a plane ticket. But, you know, it was one, you know, it's one of those moments, one of those, one of those moments that you think back and you think, wow, if, if I had had someone's ear to bend and I said, you know, should I do this? Even though I'm scared and I don't have the money, should I do it? You know, I think about what it, what it, my career might be exactly the same, but it might be totally different. You know, if I had gotten on a plane and, 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 and gone to, to Wales to work yeah, do, with do you, so, yeah, I agree. You know, yeah, do like you mentorship agree. is really powerful, I think, because it's those, it's, it's like what those little moments and those decisions add up to that create a career. So I agree, mentorship is really key. Especially for first, first gen creative students, you know, um, and our students at CC get, I think, a really good support system around that. So, yeah. Yeah. And to add to that, also mentorship, and then also, like Chomo said a number of different times, with family members and with parents in particular, also having the openness to, to recognize these different fields as professionally acceptable. Um, and even if not, it's also, you know, be able to have a little bit of blind faith, which I know is super hard. And especially like many of us come from immigrant backgrounds. Like this is not like this unknown situation is not okay. Um, but 
also recognizing that this is a different economy, very much so, um, than one generation ago, let alone even like half a generation ago. TikTok has just become like a huge economic platform. Social media has become a huge economic platform and there are people that are making so they're making their livings off of being digital or content creators. And some of that, you know, a lot of that is based in um, design principles. And so, I mean, there's just a huge connection. So thank you again, Jomo, for making those um, ties and, and, you know, maybe in the next generation or two, we'll see some of those changes. Oh, yeah. um, and I, I have another question from, um, Michelle that has been waiting here for a while. So thank you, Michelle, for your patience. Um, just to get back to like a, a like more data and technical um, sense, can you suggest resources for collecting data for other design disciplines besides studio-based furniture design? Say that again? Yeah, sorry. Oh, um, yes. Can you suggest resources for data collection for other disciplines outside of studio-based furniture design? I mean, again, I the way I did it is it, really not tool-based. You know, I, I did um, so pretty much a guerrilla warfare on the uh, furniture companies. So uh, thinking outside the box is pretty much my approach. What I said was, look, all these design companies license and brand <clears throat> from designers that they think will help carry their product. So I said, who are they? Who, who would they, and would they list them on their page? Of course, because they're used for branding. So I went, and in some cases, uh, we scraped the data if the web page allowed it. Um, and it was based on R. R is a free, free tool online. There's a whole bunch of tutorial on that one. Uh, then the friend helped me write a couple of scripts, but most of them were not able, we were not able to scrape it because of the way the, the website were structured. So what we did is actually physically count. I have screen captured everybody's photograph from each website, um, just in case I, need, I needed a backup and counted them. And I counted them like three times to make sure I didn't miss it. Now, could I have, uh, uh, you know, if you add even a factor error of plus or minus five, the, the, the data I collected uh, was still terrible when it comes to the amount of, uh, and using the same idea, you can apply it to any industry. If they use the, the, the list of people is out in the public, like branded items. So if there's no branding and there's no personality sitting on a website, how would you get the data? I knew, for example, if we approached each company and said, hey, give us how many, uh, the, the breakdown of the, the race breakdown of each company's designers, none of them would give it to us. So I had to quietly do this and just let them know, look, there's other ways to find it, even if you're potentially unwilling to do it. Would this method work for other industries? It, it depends what they're exposing on their, on their public sites. So it is really dependent on that and not specifically tool because you can find so many different tools for grabbing data of, uh, of people's website these days. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if I completely answered that, but um, I, I thought the question was about how do you, you know, what kind of tools would you use for other industries to extract data? And it's, it's not about the extraction, but you know, what available data there is there to extract. This is exactly why I love our conversations because you have, you have craft tools in so many different realms, making furniture, data collection. Yeah. You know, this is the diversity of conversation. I think that's really, um, that's been really wonderful to be a part of and, and to learn from also. Um, we're at about 7.15 and I really, I have so many other questions. I mean, we haven't even talked about your work. You know, I think you'll have to come back and. <laughs> then I can grill you a little bit about craft and you know challenging the modernist project and all these other fun things that I think we could talk about. That would be cool. um, but it, Acacia and Jim, do you have any final notes you want to add before we um, start to wrap up the evening? Unfortunately, 
I second your sentiment. I think we'll have to have you back, Jomo, because <laughs> you know I'm. Go- I feel very honored that I got to have a um, like direct conversation with you before, and I still had a lot of questions. Um, but I think um, in the end, I am so motivated and inspired by um, what you could say has been like a lifetime of work and a lifetime of values that you have continued to follow as an artist, as a creator, as a person who is um, basically like a warrior. And so I just wanna say, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your example. It is because of the example of um, artists, of people like you, that people like me and students that I am supporting can number one, actually visualize what it looks like to be comfortable being yourself in sometimes industries that tell you, no, you are not valued, you're not okay, you're not gonna be paid, you're not gonna be chosen, you're not gonna be represented, but give us your work, you know? Um, So I just, I'm so honored, I feel so privileged. I want to thank, you know, all of you, students for coming, all of our colleagues for being here. Um, I think that these are the, these conversations are some of the ways that we can actually start to personify the things that we say when we do the black squares. And when we say that, you know, we have all these mission statements that include Black Lives Matter and includes, um, you know, our solidarity with indigenous peoples and people of color. This is actually, to me, one of the steps as to what it looks like. And to put you in a position where you can share your story, um, to me feels like that is the actual work. So thank you for being here. Thank you so much for your perspective. I'm excited to when, when we can welcome you back. Wink, wink. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and we, in my- After time, July 16th, right? Or is that the right date? We're gonna have a lot to talk about in my class. So I just thank you so much for, for coming and sharing. Yeah, I mean, uh, first, uh, thank you for such a, a gracious group of people for having me over. I, I really appreciate it. This has been, uh, again, m- we, we've had more than two conversations with Catherine and uh, Keisha with you last week. Uh, even that ended up being a full hour, like you mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, I, I cannot thank you enough for giving me the platform uh, to discuss my journey. Uh, hopefully it was enriching to to your uh, students, to you and everyone else uh, who who listened to it. Uh, Again, there is more that could be done in the industry. I'm just uh, one person collaborating with other uh, black designers in the guild and other places. And I encourage uh, students when they get out of this wonderful school that they don't forget about uh, lifting people who are behind them. This, this got to be done, some of it through their story, some physically. Uh, so thank you for this opportunity. Uh, thank you. And um, again, I hope we can find uh, everyone here, actually, I hope we can find ways to continue these conversations, even off of the group, off of this Zoom grid and, and into our classrooms and into our practices. Um, a lot of students in the CCA community and other educators here. So. Um, you know, let's keep in, let's all try to keep in touch. And uh, yeah, um, maybe uh, can we ask all of our uh, team to turn videos on for a minute so we can see everyone and thank everyone. The amount of work it takes to have a seamless evening like this is of course immense. So um, thank you, Helen Maria, Kimberly and Christy for um, a great talk tonight. And thank you all for coming. Thank you for having me. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank, thank you all. So amazing. Well. Good night. Thank you, Jomo. Thanks, thank Christy, you. Catherine. Bye, Catherine. Kimberly. Bye. Bye. And Shyla.